Right now, we're going to get into just the first noble truth. We're going to look into that. The word in Sanskrit for the first is dukkha, and then dukkha in Pali. And what does that mean? Well, everybody's been wondering about this for a long time, and lots of people disagree. It's typically translated as suffering. Of course, that's how I've been translating it all day. Uh, but it's not a very good translation because it means any kind of dissatisfaction. So let's say that you're not, that right now, you're not perfectly comfortable in absolute bliss. That's suffering. If you're in heaven, if you live in heaven, that still counts as suffering. Because heaven, even heaven isn't perfect. For lots of different reasons, it's not perfect. Uh, but also, living in hell is suffering. And everything from having a little itch on your face to being in absolute pain, just complete agony, all of that counts as some kind of suffering, some kind of dukkha. Now, what's the point here? Well, there are different ways of understanding this word. And one thing that people do is they look into etymology, and I think that etymology is, you know, it's useful. Of course, you don't get a definition of a word through its etymology, but it can be helpful to consider the word differently. And one, part, one way to look at the etymology is that the do means bad, and then the ka is from sta, which means that something is established or standing. So it's, it's cognate with the English word stand. So it means it stands badly. In other words, it's unstable. Or if you wish, as I would like to translate it, it is untrustworthy. You can't count on it. So dukkha is referring to all these things that you can't count on. So the claim of the First Noble Truth is there are things that, that are unstable that you can't count on. The basis of suffering, though, is made very clear in the definition of the First Noble Truth. So one thing that's suffering is birth. And why is birth unstable or untrustworthy or you can't count on it? Well, first of all, it feels terrible. It's awful. Really bad thing to do. That's one thing. You know, you were warm and then you're cold. It's a mess. You're covered in blood. I mean, it's horrible. You're screaming. Of course you're going to scream. You're going to cry. You're hungry. Beyond that, whatever you may think, I would suggest the Buddhist way of looking at it is even when you're in the womb, it's not that good. And why isn't it that good? Because you're being trapped in this horrible little body that's just gross. You have this body now. It has arms and eyes. You can't really see, but still. And everything is getting condensed into this form. It's, it's very uncomfortable. Then you're trapped. Then you get out, and that's bad. So there are bad things about it. Is there beauty in it? Absolutely. And one of the problems, especially with kind of beginner Buddhists, is that they jump too, fa too fast into the point that there's suffering in birth. Is there a miracle in birth? Yes. Is there a joy in birth? Yes. Is it something that we should all be in awe of and revere? Yes. It's, it's, it's something that, that totally blows your mind <laughs> to be a part of. You're never the same again. How did, how did this thing, how did this being, this miracle happen? How did that happen? There is a miracle. Life is a miracle. It's that birth is not something you can really count on. It's not something that you can stay with. You can't stay a baby forever. You have to grow up. However much resistance we may have <laughs> to that, you still have to do it. You've got to grow up and not be a baby or a toddler or a child or a teen anymore. At some point, you have to grow up. Okay, well, you say, well, that's not so bad. At least I grew up. But hold on. <laughs> 
A lot of the stuff that happens as you're growing up is awful, such as getting sick. So you thought, oh, it's going to be super. And then you got sick, and it was awful. Or you got tired, or you're infirm in some other way. Or you get even older. You can't stop it. You thought, well, that was going to be OK, because I was going to go from being a baby to being a nice, healthy person in my 20s. And what, but whatever most of you believe, you're not going to be in your 20s forever. Why? Because you can't count on your 20s. You can't do it. You're, got, you're not going to be in your 20s for very long. I know it seems crazy. No one has ever told you this before. But it's true. And then you can't stay in your 30s. And no matter what happens, you can't stay there. You can't count on it. You can't believe in it. You can't base an identity on it because everything you're trying to base yourself on changes, falls away. It doesn't stand well. It's unstable. And so every time that you cling to it, the suffering begins right there. Then you get even older, and then you can't see, and you can't think, and you need diapers, and people have to care for you, and you feel vulnerable and ashamed, and all of your hopes that you're going to be wise and people would come and visit you and want your wisdom aren't realized. When it's finally time for you to die, you don't want to die anymore. It's terrifying. It turns out this whole time you have been afraid of death, and you never faced it, and now you have to. Now, is there not a miracle in death? There is a miracle in death. Absolutely. I don't know how many of you have ever been in the presence of a birth or a death, but to be in the presence of death is absolutely, it is at least as miraculous as birth. It is, it is absolutely beyond comprehension. There is suffering in it, but it isn't really so valid it's confusing for us because we often think birth is good and death is bad, but that isn't really how this world works or how we work. There's suffering in both. There's a miracle in both. Beyond that, through that entire process, we're getting things we don't want. Happens all the time. And you don't get things you do like as you go through this process. You are united with people who you find annoying. You have to spend time with them. And you feel like, well, maybe someday I'll only be around the people who I like and we can always talk about things that I agree with. But no, it will never happen. It doesn't work that way. This, these are aspects of, <clears throat> of suffering. Now, we're not saying that everything always is awful, but we are saying that there are difficulties as you go through life. And one of the things that's difficult is finding something you can trust, finding something you can count on. And again and again, as we go through life, this basic point that the Buddha is trying to make for us is the things that you try to count on, the things that you trust, are bad. You can't trust them. You cling to them and try to say, this is really who I am. And if I just hold on to this, then I will be happy forever. And then it turns out that, that exactly clinging to that thing is suffering. Specifically, that means I'm, I'm trying to, to depend upon something that is not dependable. Specifically, of course, in the definition of the First Noble Truth, specifically the five skandhas. And what are the five skandhas? The five skandhas are the five types of things. And if I had to define skanda, I would, def I, I would translate it not as aggregates, but as types of things, categories of phenomena that you could cling to as a self. These are the things that you would cling to in hopes that you would have a place to stand. That you somehow would have something to stand on, where you would finally be safe and happy and right. You would finally have truth and uh, ease and peace. We want something that we can stand on, where that will happen. And 
The point made by the Buddha is that is pure ignorance and it will never work. It will never ever work. You have a completely wrong strategy here. That's the point being made here uh, in this teaching of the Four Noble Truths. So specifically, we're going to get more and more specific. There are these five things of form, of what's often, which means physical form. What's typically translated as feelings. This Vedana is sometimes translated as sensations. But it means something more like judgment. Maybe judgment is a better way to talk about it. It means that you either like it, don't like it, or don't really care about it. There's sanjnya, which is sometimes translated as perception or conception. Conception meaning your idea of things. Uh, then there is sanskara or sanskaras, and if you combine English and Sanskrit. Uh, but sanskara is plural, and that means patterning or choices or um, uh, productions, constructions, and then vijnana or consciousness, uh, which is to say your way of uh, experiencing this or that, way of pointing at this or that, dividing things apart so that you can have a certain type of experience. It is absolutely critical that we understand uh, that these five things are not only not trustworthy, but they're not yourself. And so the Buddha has metaphors. His metaphors are, are incredible, incredibly skillful. And the metaphors <clears throat> talk about how it is that it isn't that we're saying that these things don't exist. It's that we're saying that they don't exist in any sort of substantial way that you could depend on. They don't, in particular, they don't exist of themselves. If they existed of themselves, well then, that would be fine, then you could count on them. You could depend on them in some way. But they do not exist of themselves. That's why they are non-self. And that's why you shouldn't cling to them as a self. 